Today we're revisiting one of our very first episodes where I spoke with Angel Fuller, a certified peer specialist. Angel's message of self-acceptance is one that absolutely everybody needs to hear. So stay tuned and get ready to be inspired as we reduce the stigma. A note to the audience, Reduce the Stigma is an initiative to break down the stigma surrounding mental health, addiction, and other life experiences that are commonly discriminated against. We do this by sharing the real stories of individuals who have experienced stigma and the organizations that support them. While we intentionally avoid stigmatizing language, we do not censor the language of individuals with lived and living experience. We respect their right to use the words they prefer. Our episodes include discussion of drug use, trauma, violence, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and other potentially upsetting or triggering topics. If you find yourself in need of urgent support, please call 988 or 911. Audience discretion is advised. Welcome to Reduce the Stigma, brought to you by Straight Up Care. Today we have an episode of Meet the Peer, a special series where we shine the spotlight on peer specialists. And welcome to Meet the Peer, a special series where we shine the spotlight on peer specialists. On this episode of Meet the Peer, we have Angel Fuller, a certified peer support specialist in North Carolina. Welcome, Angel. Good morning. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me and being willing to share your story with all of us. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And so what I'd love to start with is if you can just share your journey, uh, what your lived experience is. Oh, boy. A little bit of, well, I would say co-occurring. So some mental health history as well as uh, substance use history. Um, Presently, for today, um, I've been in recovery for over 11 years uh, from substance use. And I uh, work diligently every day to maintain the mental health portion of that. Um, and that one for me can be a little bit more difficult, um, but uh, making sure that I stay on top of it and uh, do all of the things that are in my personal care plan um, to maintain that mental health is very important for me. Um, so lengthy sobriety, but um, not as long in the mental health category. And it's something that a lot of people experience, having to tend to both, you know, mental health and substance use. And it can be complicated and and difficult. Uh, Any tricks or or tips that you have for someone who may also be experiencing a co-occurring diagnosis? Um, Personally, I think first and foremost, maintaining sobriety off the top, because there's no way that you can work on your mental health if you're introducing substances into your body that can alter your moods by themselves, Um, then it becomes really difficult to separate the line of what is your actual mental health and what is a result of that substance use. So first and foremost, just maintaining the abstinence from substances. Then we can delve deeper into the mental health portion of that. Um, I encourage therapy, obviously peer support, because that's why I'm here. Um, Medication management, if necessary. making sure your support system is in place and having those secure people that you feel comfortable um, introducing into your life so that when you are in the midst of that panic or that crisis, whether it's the want to use the substances or struggling in a downward spiral with your mental health, um, that person that you can go to um, who can immediately know who to contact for you and what to do for you. Thank you. Those are very helpful. And you mentioned peer support, of course, like you said, that that's why we're here today, why we're talking. Can you share in your own words, what is peer support? Um, I think of peer support as your number one companion. Um, the, the first person that you can go to in the midst of a crisis, sometimes it's hard to go to your family or your friends because you're afraid of the judgment. You know, maybe they felt like you were doing really, really good lately and you don't want to let them down by telling them that you are struggling. That peer support is somebody who can carry you along the journey from the start um, onward. Um, 
Specifically for me, I liked being with my clients from the very beginning and getting to know them and watching them grow, but also being there in those backslides because they're going to happen. I've heard the term so many times, relapse is part of recovery. And I don't know if that's true for everybody, but that relapse could be substance. That relapse could be in your mental health care. Um, And we're the person who's not going to judge you at all. We're the unbiased individual um, who's not afraid to pick you back up at any given time. And that can be extremely powerful, uh, that safe, nonjudgmental space. That's certainly one aspect of why peer support is so important. What would you say are some other key aspects of peer support that makes it so important? Uh, Accountability. Just because I'm not going to judge you doesn't mean that I'm not going to be firm with you. You know, sometimes we don't need somebody to always pat us on the back. And oftentimes friends and family, they're, you know, we're we're fearful of their judgment, but then uh, they're also afraid of, of seeing us harm ourselves. So sometimes they might be willing to enable our choices and our behaviors. Um, and as a peer support, I'm not going to enable your behaviors or your choices, but I will show you ways to work through your behaviors and your choices. So we're here for non-judgmental support, but we're also here for accountability. Um, and it, accountability, uh, providing you further resources, leading you in a direction um, to become independent. You know, I'm going to hold your hand, but I want you to be able to do it on your own because I may not be here forever. You know, so teaching independence, accountability, along with the lack of judgment. And what led you to become a peer specialist? Oh, boys. (laughs) When I first started my journey into recovery with substance use specifically, um, I remember the process. So um, my dad came and he picked me up and he took me to the hospital and the hospital said, okay, you have a problem. We're going to send you to detox. And then I did that. You know, I went straight from the hospital to the detox and that was seven days of intense, you know, let's just make sure you don't die Um, because my drug of choice was alcohol. I used other substances too, but my main substance of choice was alcohol. And as we most commonly know, alcohol detox can be deadly. So, you know, the only goal in my detox was to make sure that I made it out of there in seven days, you know, still intact. So I did that. But then after I left there, what what's next? Right. So I went back home. Well, what am I supposed to do there? I don't know how to live like this. This isn't something that I've done in a long time. I have not adulted without substances in a very long time. What do I do? And I remember my dad's wife searching for programs for me. And the hardest part of finding a program for me was I'm not a criminal. I have no criminal record whatsoever. And I encountered with all the programs, they would tell her, well, if she's not court ordered to come here, we can't help her. Um, and so I even had a gentleman in in the AA rooms. Um, he did alcohol assessments and things like that for the court system. And he says, I hate to tell you this, he said, but you might just have to go back out there one more time and seriously mess up and get yourself in trouble if you want the help you say you want. And I wasn't willing to do that, right? So my dad's wife finally found one program that accepted only the willing, not the court ordered, just the willing. And um, I went through that program. It was intensive. It was in-house. And it was amazing. Um, And even at that point, I still had not learned about peer supports. Um, But a few years into sobriety, I learned about peer support specialists. And I was like, those are the people. Those are the people who could have helped me in the beginning when I didn't know where to go. And, you know, I Mm -hmm. was choosing between staying uh, sober and in recovery or going back out and making uh, illegal decisions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because that seemed to be the only way to get help. Um, those are the people who could have walked with me and held my hand through the process. And even if I'd have never found a program to go to, I would have known that there was somebody else like me. And, you know, them sharing their stories with me and their experiences with me on how they stopped themselves from making those decisions and how to live in as, as an adult in society again um, without substances and, and things like that. Um, so when I found out about the program, um, my past negative experience with trying to be in recovery is what made me want to do this. That is 
disturbing that you hit a roadblock because you did not have that record, criminal record. And it's just a sad example of how our system really falls short in many ways. And what a great point that peers can help figure out the very complex way to go about the system, finding treatment, getting into treatment, how to live life in recovery. I mean, there's so much experience that provides that perspective and that insight that no one else can offer. Indeed. And what excites you? What gets you just so eager uh, to work with someone as a peer specialist? Um, I like to say all the time, it, I just have a spirit of service, right? So to be there for the individual, like when I first started my recovery journey, I remember my oldest child was three and my biggest fear was her um, despising me the way I had despised my mother. Um, I grew up without her um, and that was by her choice, right? And I felt like if I didn't find myself in this recovery program, then she would feel as if I had chosen not to be there for her. Um, so it's not just about me and it's not just about the person that I work with. It's about the individuals that are in their lives around them as well. It's a whole system situation, right? If we can assist in aiding and recovering the individual, then we can aid in recovering the family unit and then the friends and then the employment. Um, peer support to me is very much like the dichotomy between psychology and social work, right? We suffer from these things that come from us biologically, maybe the, the substance use and the mental health deficits, but then those things are also exacerbated by what we have going on in, in society and in our lives. And it's, it's peer support is almost like marrying the two of those together. Um, and so being able to bring the personal knowledge and education from myself and then the understanding of the biology and the understanding of the need for the social supports um, and, and providing all that to the individual in one place, like they don't have to search for it. Um, that's what makes me want to do peer support for the individual. That's really admirable. It, it, it's complex out there. And uh, you're right, you know, helping one person, they're loved by people. They're, they have people in their lives and you can impact many, many more than that one maybe identified individual you're working directly with. Mm -hmm. Now, you shared that you have a, a co-occurring diagnosis with substance use and mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, what experiences do you offer peer support for? This could be things like grief, trauma, uh, parenting, anything else that you'd like people to know that you have that experience with? Oh, gosh. Grief and trauma, for sure. Um, childhood trauma, early adult trauma, um, sexual abuse trauma. Um, also, um, being a caregiver or family member of someone with um, physical disabilities. Um, I have one child who has extreme physical disabilities, and I have another one who has mental health concerns as well. So being a parent um, and a guardian and a caregiver of those who are struggling with long-term care needs, uh, whether it be your child or your, your family member or whatever, um, because I also have uh, 10 years of ongoing experience in the actual medical field itself, too. So I don't just work on this side. I work with you know, the physical body as well. So um, even in that regard, I've got to work with patients and their families as far as, you know, the grief and, and decision making and dealing with families with long term care needs and such like that, too. Um, Post traumatic stress disorder. Um, I can even give you a little bit of knowledge on financially savvy choices. <laughs> um, there you go. I'm a full-time college student in my 30s, so I can also assist with how to make those transitions back into the, the education realm um, to enhance your education to be better in society as well. Um, and I love to provide um, workplace experience or, you know, uh, workplace counseling as far as trying to find employment that suits your aptitudes and things like that. Very strengths, it sounds. Try. <laughs> yeah. 
lots of things there that you can really, you know, meet a lot of people who are, are in need of that type of support. So that that's incredible. Uh, you know, obviously my heart is with you for everything you've been through. Um, it just kind of shows that peer support is for far more than, than mental health and, and substance use. It's about getting through life uh, with someone who knows and who has been there. Thank is you. there anything else? Is there anything else you would like people to know about your style as a peer specialist? Mm. Well, in the very beginning, I would say that I am uh, very much interested. There's an intense desire to get to know you, right? I don't dive straight into what can we do for you and how can we help you because I can't help you if I don't know you. Um, so that's important to me is first just getting the space and time to get to know you and for you to get to know me. Um, it's a great space and time to share stories and experiences and things like that. Um, but once we get into the hard stuff, we get into the hard stuff. And, you know, I always leave a space and a time for you to step back and reflect and evaluate on where we are and, you know, why it's hard and why it hurts. Um, but then I push you and encourage you to continue to work past that and through that. Um, because the other side is so much more exciting <laughs> than all the stuff we've been holding on to and going through. Um, and so I want you to see those joys and see those excitements, but you can't get there until you work through all the things first. Um, so I'll be encouraging and I'll be kind and I'll be patient, but I'll probably be tough too. <laughs> that makes me think kind of coming full circle to what you said earlier on that you want the person to be able to do these things that you're not necessarily going to be there for everything and forever. Yeah. You want them to be able to have the skills and, and that's very empowering. It is. It is. I mean, you know, and I think just even to raising my kids, right? Like I struggle immensely with the idea of my oldest child becoming an independent individual in society without me. Like it literally tears my heart out. I remember being at a meeting for her school not too long ago and they said, okay, well, in about a year, we're going to start talking about college and independent living and all those things. And I was like, hold on a minute. <laughs> we will not talk about that. But um, I have to be able to build her up to do those things, right? Because my biggest fear is for the day when I pass and, and, and hoping that I have given her enough emotionally, mentally, financially support system wise, and that she has gained a network of her own people that are going to be able to carry her far past my existence. And so if I am required and in, in, in require of myself to give that to her, then when I work with a peer, I require of myself to give that to them too, because I can be here and hold your hand and do everything for you today. But when the day comes that you have to do this by yourself, what are you going to do? Are you going to be able to do it? Or are you going to regress? Or are you just going to stand in place and do nothing? What are you going to do without me? And I want you to have the faith and confidence in yourself that even without me, you have all the ability to do all those things that you've learned and had a desire for, and you're going to make it. I love that. That's, that's helping people prepare for long-term independent success. That's it. So coming to our, our final questions, um, you know, we are challenging stigma. We want to reduce it and, and really just eliminate it would be preferable. If you had only one thing you could say to challenge stigma, whatever comes to mind for you when you hear that word, what would it be? To challenge stigma? It's okay to be different. It doesn't matter if you have mental health issues. It doesn't matter if you have substance issues. It doesn't matter if you have physical disabilities. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the room, but you have no friends. We're not required to be the same ever in any form of life. And the only person you're in competition with tomorrow is who you were yesterday. So it's okay to be different. I'm not bothered. 
I'm just not bothered. <laughs> I know that like when, when people say they're not bothered, that typically carries a, a negative connotation, but really I'm just not bothered. And if you're not bothered, then it doesn't matter. That sounds so, very freeing. Yeah. That's more than one word, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that was amazing. I mean, that that's incredible to be able to let go of what, of caring about what others think about us, not in that I don't care, I'm giving up sense, but in that I am comfortable with myself and I know who I am. That is very freeing and, and can really allow someone to to live in a completely different way. For sure. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're all human. So at some point, somebody's going to hurt our feelings, right? And we're going to feel that for a minute. Um, but just like I, I tell my daughter from time to time, you know, you can go there and you can be there for a minute, but don't pack a bag. You know, you got things to do, <laughs> you know? So even though I say I'm not bothered and I'm I'm okay with it, I'm just like anybody else. Every now and again, I might feel that stigma or I might feel that shame from what my past life is. And believe you me, there's some people in my life who still like to remind me who I was. <laughs> um, But today I know myself, right? So when so-and-so says, well, back then you did X, Y, Z, I take accountability for that. Of course I did that. 100%. No denying it. But that's not who I am now. So I'm not bothered. At the end of the day, you're going to hurt my feelings for a second. And then I'm going to remind myself that I'm better than I was yesterday. And I'm better than I was 10 years ago. And it doesn't matter. And if you don't like me, well, unfortunately, that's a personal problem. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I mean, this is perfect tie in here. There's going to be someone watching this interview or maybe listening to it and they're having a difficult time. What would you like them to hear? I want you. And it, take that however you take it. But I want you. I want you to feel better. I want you to come to me. I want you to have faith in yourself. I want you to desire better. I want you fill in the blank. Wow. I'm a little speechless. That's, I hope they hear that. I, I hope that resident, that they truly hear that. And I just am excited for people to be able to connect with you. And if uh, if you're listening to this and or watching this interview and you would like to work with Angel, you can uh, look at the details for this video and see the link to connect with her directly. Um, but I just can't thank you enough, Angel, for joining me and sharing your story and your very uplifting perspective on the role that that peers can play. And I, I thank you for having me. I'll be honest with you. I got a little uh, personally emotional because these aren't things that people ask me on a regular basis. Right. But, you know, when you fill out a form online to describe yourself, it's it, for me, it's hard to get passionate about who I am and what I want to do for other people. Um, but being able to say it out loud, um, that, that's meant a lot to me today. So thank you. I'm honored to have been able to be part of this conversation with you. And I'm sure that we're going to have people really eager to connect with you as well. So thank you so much again. And we will be seeing you hopefully soon again to have more inspiring conversations. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on our mission to reduce the stigma by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. You can watch our full episodes on our Amazon Fire and Roku TV channels, as well as at ReduceTheStigma.com. Reduce the Stigma is hosted by me, Whitney Minarchek, edited by Sarah Elash, and music by Audiosphere. This has been a Straight Up Care production.